raising large arachnids, centipedes. This is big boy. This is my big, beautiful male, Theraphosa sturmi. Now this animal is bigger than my hand. And an animal of this size, feeding it on a diet predominantly of crickets, which is the most readily available prey source, is one that's very cost effective, but it's also not really providing a good solid cornerstone of nutrition for said animal. So you gotta look at different prey sources. Now this animal in the wild may eat the occasional small mammal or bird, but too much of that in the diet could have ill effects. So the one thing that we are able to keep here in Canada, and I go if you're from the States or Europe and you, you have all sorts of these available, and in Canada we've only been able to have one. And it's only been rather recently. And that is the discoid roach. So let's take a peek at Blabrus discoidialis. An incredible cockroach and an incredible food source for large tarantulas such as Big Boy. Cockroaches also provide a great alternative feed for larger reptiles such as my large pair of Europlatus frimbriatus. This is a gecko that is, you know, same sort of size as my hand. That's the girl and she's decidedly smaller than the male, but he's hidden at the back. There's the big boy at the back eyeing me up, wondering what am I doing in his lair. Oh, just incredible animals. And I can either release them loose in here, but because of all the substrate in this type of an enclosure, the cockroach is more than likely just going to go right into the bottom of the substrate. So I tend to feed them in deli cups. Cockroaches are pretty easy to maintain. And honestly, I've had no issue whatsoever. And there's actually pretty much zero smell. Now it's, that smell is all going to be dependent somewhat on how you take care of them, how you feed them, and so forth. But I've had no issue. The one thing about them is they do require slightly elevated temperature above room temperature to truly prosper. So I have a small seed mat. It's not small, it's a 10 inch by 20 inch seed mat. And it's honestly just duct taped to the side of the, the enclosure. This is a low voltage seed mat. So it's not like buying a reptile, say like a ZooMed heat pad or something. It's very, very low voltage. It's just enough to give a slight little bit of warmth and increases that one side. So there's no risk of it damaging the tub. I did originally place one below the tub and I ended up having a situation where uh, I started losing the plastic was starting to weaken. You can see I've added some good quality ventilation to the top. But what you really want to see is you want to see how they're being taken care of inside. Their care is honestly pretty straightforward. I have maybe an inch, you know, maybe two inches of cocoa fiber. This is coarse cocoa fiber as my base. Now when I originally started with the culture, I read a fair bit about them and it said that they need a fairly warm and moist environment. So what I used to do was I used to, when I go and misted my enclosures, I would also go in and turn mist this unit here, primarily just the cocoa fiber, never the eggshell cartons, but uh, just the, the cocoa fiber, and it provided that moisture bed. I have also gone to the sometimes where I've gone and taken water in a pitcher from a fish tank and just added in there for humidity. I've kind of gone away from that. The, the you know, it doesn't really, it's, it's, it's moisture retentive, but it doesn't really need it. And I don't provide, you notice there's no drinking source. We're going to get to that food and water in a bit. But otherwise, the only structure in here is egg cartons. And, uh, you know, you can buy the egg, you can you know, obviously recycle. You can see mine are all just torn up recycled egg cartons. But you can easily buy them at any one of your farm and feed stores. If you, have, if you live in an area like I do out in the country. And it may not look like much to see them right now. But this culture is absolutely loaded. Every single piece of egg crate is absolutely covered. Now one of the nicest features about this particular roach is it cannot climb. 
And that, what I mean by that, obviously it can climb. Oh, you can see them climbing. But what I mean is they cannot climb smooth surfaces. So they cannot, I could literally leave this wide open and they would not be able to escape unless I obviously took, you know, a piece of uh, egg carton and raised it right up to the top. Well, obviously then they could then, but otherwise they're ultimate cockroach for doing this. Almost the other, most of the cockroach species, you'll have to put some sort of sticky tape or a Vaseline layer or something like that. You have to maintain it all the time. This particular species cannot get out, cannot climb the flat surface. So they are ideal for this type of situation. Now the babies start off very small. They're easy to care for. They pretty much just live in the substrate and, and they obviously come out for the food, but otherwise they just kind of bury in the substrate until they've molted a few times and then you start seeing them growing up until they eventually reach their adult phase. There's one that's growing, it's starting to grow up a little bit more. And then the adult phase is when they develop their wings. But they're, they're flightless, these are not animals that can fly. I just don't want them jumping off and into the house. They run really, really fast. <laughs> and this is not something I want to have loose in my house. But they're quiet. So these are actually better in my house than having crickets in the house. My wife appreciates these more. She may not have appreciated them as the Christmas present that I gave to her, but uh, from a keeping standpoint, these are very, very easy to keep. Now when these uh, eggshell cartons get a little bit, you know, a little bit more san and less sanitary and stuff and you want to easily replace them, as I say, there's it's just an egg carton, so there's nothing fancy to it. They just use it as structure. They're kind of fascinating animals all on them's own. This one here is getting old. Its wings are starting to fall apart. That's the type of ones that I generally use mostly as the feeders for the big tarantulas, such as Big Boy or maybe Pinky. I did get invaded by crickets, so I honestly, I have almost a, a perpetual source of crickets in varying sizes for most of the smaller tarantulas and some. And because they, I can kind of keep it in check by going through them regularly, I have little tiny pinhead crickets there and some different sizes. So I've got something at all times. As long as I kind of keep them in check, they don't really tend to take over. And they don't. And they, the crickets cannot get out once they get in. So I don't know how they got in originally, but they got in, they infected the, or infested the colony. And, uh, but honestly, they haven't become a problem. Now you guys are wondering next is how we go about taking care of them. How do we feed them? What do we do to take care of them? Well, other than feeding, I don't provide really any form of moisture source whatsoever. And I'll give full credit to other people. And I believe the individual that I'm following that uh, suggested this was uh, Dave over at Beasley uh, in the UK, an incredible tarantula keeper, very, very educational channel. But uh, basically I feed a good quality spring mix. Spring mix is a, is a mix of field greens different types of greens and stuff. Each one of these types of greens is gonna have a different nutritional panel, different levels of calcium and so forth, which is great because it may not affect your, your tarantulas as much, but it's definitely gonna be more beneficial if you're feeding something like geckos, like the, like the big Europlatus geckos that we showed you, or some of like the toke geckos in the other room. So honestly, this is the bulk of what I feed them. Just flatten out their thing a little bit here. Nothing fancier than that. And I come down and I drop that in. Now the other things I do offer occasionally, it's only when they're when they're here, apple cores. And if you really want to increase your production, adding some citrus. But uh, you know, oranges and everything right now are just such an absolute high price here in Canada because it's totally out of season. So I tend to stick mostly just to a thing of spring mix. I can buy a big tub of it for about six to ten dollars, depending on the size, and that'll last me pretty much a month. So you know, six dollars for food for for animals they are gonna feed all my animals, it's definitely a well-sped value. Honestly, that's about it. And I can harvest, I don't, you know, I don't have hundreds of animals that are eating them, so I don't ever over-harvest it. Now, as I've shown you, they're very, very easy to raise in captivity. Temperature-wise, I've shown you the heating mat. The temperature should range anywhere above 75, but ideally 85 to 90 degrees gives them their peak breeding. So, if anybody's got any more questions, feel free or free already to leave me a comment. Feel free to share the video. And as always, my friends, thank you kindly for watching.